it's very useful to understand how the poles and zeros of a system described by a linear constant coefficient difference equation impact the frequency response magnitude. So basically, we want to study how the poles and zeros influence the magnitude of h of e to the j omega. We know that if our system is stable, then the region of convergence is going to include the magnitude z equals 1, or the unit circle, so I can obtain the frequency response magnitude from the z transform by substituting for z with e to the j omega. So my frequency response for a system described by a linear constant coefficient difference equation is just the sum k equals 0 to m bk e to the minus j omega k divided by the sum k equals 0 to n a k e to the minus j omega k. Now it's useful to rewrite this in pole zero form as we have done previously on other occasions. We'll write h of e to the j omega as b zero over a zero factoring out the coefficients of the constant term in the numerator and the denominator and then we'll be left with a product of terms that have zeros and poles in them. So we'll have from k equals 0 to m of 1 minus ck e to the minus j omega and we'll have from k equals 0 to n 1 minus dk e to the minus j omega. So if I take the magnitude of this expression the magnitude of a product is just the product of the magnitude, so I can write this as the magnitude of b0 divided by the magnitude of a0. The product, 0 to m, of the magnitude of 1 minus ck e to the minus j omega times the product k equals 0 to n of 1 minus dk e to the minus j omega. Now what we're going to do is factor e to the minus j omega out of the numerator as well as factor it out of the denominator terms. And if I do that, I'm not going to have e to the minus j omega on the ck, but I'm going to end up with e to the plus j omega in place of the 1. And I have the product, k equals 0 to m, of the magnitude of e to the j omega minus ck divided by the product k equals 0 to n, magnitude of e to the j omega minus dk, v term that we factored out, the e to the minus j omega, from each of these m products, of course has magnitude 1, as does the e to the minus j omegas that we factored out of the denominator. So this term doesn't have an impact on the magnitude. Now, this is a very useful form in which to study the relationship between the frequency response and the poles and zeros of the system. What we see is that the magnitude of the frequency response depends on terms of this type. In the numerator, we had e to the j omega minus a zero, and in the denominator, we had e to the j omega minus a pole. So if we understand how this term behaves, we can characterize the entire magnitude response of the system. What we're looking at is a vector connecting the point e to the j omega, which lies on the unit circle. So this has unit magnitude and angle omega. So this point right here is e to the j omega. And then I have some other point a, and e to the j omega minus a is a vector connecting e to the j omega to a. And when we take the magnitude of that, we're looking at the length of this vector. That's what we're using in our frequency response magnitude. So if I write that out again, I've got this constant term out front, magnitude of b0 divided by the magnitude of a0. And then in the numerator, I've got a product of terms that are the distances from e to the j omega to the zero locations. And then in the denominator, I've got a product of terms representing the distances from e to the j omega to the pole locations. So we can think about the magnitude response of our system as the product of the distance from e to the j omega to the zeros divided by the products of the distances from e to the j omega to the poles. Now it turns out that if e to the j omega is close to a zero, then the distance between e to the j omega and the zero is very small. And since this is in the numerator, it's going to make h of e to the j omega small. On the other hand, when e to the j omega is close to a pole, 
then again this distance between either the j omega and the pole becomes small but that distance shows up in the denominator so as this distance becomes close to zero it causes h of e to the j omega the magnitude to become large so let's take an example where I have h of z as 1 minus 3 fourths z inverse in the denominator and 1 in the numerator. So this particular system has a 0 at z equals 0 and a pole at z equals 3 fourths as we've shown in the pole 0 plot on the bottom. Well, if I pick my frequency omega 1 fairly close to 0 for the z equals 1 point, then the distance from the 0 to e to the j omega 1 is Lz, and that's going to be 1. But the distance from the pole, which we're denoting as Lp, to e to the j omega 1 is going to be close to 1 fourth, because this is at 3 fourths, so this is at 1, that means this distance is 1 fourth. So when I compute the magnitude of h of e to the j omega 1, it should be approximately 1 divided by 1 fourth, or 4. And indeed, that's exactly what we obtain. Changing the frequency a little bit, moving further around the unit circle, now if I pick a frequency near here for omega 2, well, Lz, the distance to the 0, is going to stay at 1, but Lp, the distance to the pole, has now gotten quite a bit bigger. And let's suppose that that's about 0.77, in which case magnitude of h of e to j omega 2 is approximately 1 over 0.77, which is approximately 1.3. And if we pick a frequency here of omega-2 that is somewhere in that vicinity, we see that indeed we're getting about that value. Continuing, moving the frequency further, now out here at omega-3, we've got again the distance to the zero is one. The distance to the pole has gotten further. Now it exceeds one. And we'll suppose that it's about 1.25 in which case h of e to the j omega 3 magnitude is approximately 1 over 1.25 or about 0.8 and that's indeed what you see for omega 3 a little bigger than pi over 2 radians. And finally as we get near omega equals pi at say omega 4 here again the distance to the zero remains at 1 but the distance to the pole starts to approach 7 fourths and consequently the magnitude of h of e to the j omega 4 becomes approximately 4 sevenths as we get close to pi. By studying the distances from the unit circle to the poles and zeros as we vary frequency from zero to pi, we can gain a lot of insight into the nature of the frequency response magnitude of the system. Here's a second example where I have a second order system. I have two zeros, one at z equals plus one and the other at z equals minus one. And then I put two poles very close to the unit circle at 0.95 e to the j pi over 4. So what we're going to have for our frequency response magnitude is the product of the distances to each zero, Lz1 and Lz2, to a particular point on the unit circle associated with a frequency, say, omega 1. In the denominator, we'll have the product of the distances to each of the poles. LP1 and LP2. So as we vary omega 1 around the unit circle, this distances all change and our frequency response magnitude consequently changes. And what you can see right away is that when omega 1 is equal to 0, then we have a 0 right on the unit circle. And we know that the frequency response, well, the distance LZ1 goes to 0. So the magnitude of h of e to the j omega 1 has to be 0. And indeed, we see that when we plot the magnitude response. Another interesting thing happens when we get omega 1 real close to the pole. In that case, the minimum distance between the pole and omega 1 on the unit circle becomes 0 0.05 when omega 1 is pi over 4 because the radius of this pole is at 0.95. Consequently, in the denominator, I have a fairly small number, and these other factors are all much bigger. When I multiply these terms and I divide by the small number LP1, I get a value that's quite large. So I'm going to have a peak in the frequency response magnitude here as I pass by real close to this pole because LP1 shrinks to a very small number. And then as I get farther away again, the distances 
uh, change and I don't have anything small in the numerator or the denominator so my response falls off and then once I get over here near this zero again the distance LZ2 is small where the distances LZ1 and LP1 and LP2 are fairly large so again our frequency response goes to zero as omega1 approaches pi. Basically what's happening here is that when you have a pole near the unit circle you push the magnitude response up at those frequencies while zeros near the unit circle pull the magnitude response down and if the zero is on the unit circle of course then it forces the magnitude response to be exactly zero. Now this kind of insight can help us understand the characteristics of filters from looking at their pole zero plots. We can also use these ideas to design filters. So if I want a filter that attenuates a certain frequency, what I need to do is put a zero on the unit circle at that frequency. Let's look at an example here where I've got a filter with eight poles and they're arranged in sort of a semicircle about the z equals j. And then I have zeros at four of them at z equals one and four zeros at z equals minus one. So what can I learn from this? Of course I know what happens here is that my frequency response is going to be zero at omega equals zero and omega equals pi because of these zeros. And so as I go along the unit circle, I'm getting closer to these poles. Those show up in the denominator. As those distances shrink, it's going to push my response up. So I'm going to predict that I have sort of a pass band in this frequency range here. And then it drops off again. So this is going to be a predict. This is a band pass filter. I start with a gain of zero. I get a higher gain in this region. And then my gain drops off to zero again. If we look at the actual frequency response magnitude, we see that indeed about the frequency pi over 2, I have my passband, just as we predicted from our pole locations here. And that at 0, we've got 0, and at pi, we also have 0 because of these zeros. So from looking at the pole 0 plot, I can infer what the frequency response characteristics are going to be. Take another example. In this case, we have 20 zeros distributed throughout the z-plane, and all 20 poles are at the origin. So poles or zeros at the origin don't affect the frequency response magnitude at all because the distance to the unit circle to the origin is always 1. So in this case, the zeros are going to entirely define the behavior of the system. And I know that these zeros on the unit circle are going to cause me to have frequency response magnitude zero exactly at those frequencies. But in general, I can write then my magnitude response as product B0 times I equals 1 to 20, the product of L sub I, where L sub I is the distance from the point on the unit circle corresponding to omega to each of the zeros. So we're going to have 20 distances here. We don't have to worry about the poles because those are all the same. And what you can see is that in this region, the distances to the zeros are all larger numbers. They were not close to any particular zero. So I would expect that I have higher gain in this region than I do at the very high frequencies near pi or the lower frequencies below pi over 2. So in this case, I'm going to predict that I have a another bandpass system where from 0 to somewhat greater than pi over 2 I have very small gain then I have a pass band in this region and as I get near pi it should go back to 0. And indeed we see that as we get a little bit bigger than pi over 2 this region here we start to have a pass band and then we have our pass band ends out here as we start to get a little bigger than 3 fourths pi and we have stop bands or attenuation between 0 and certainly pi over 2 where this 0 is and then at the very high frequencies as well. So there's a lot of intuition that can be gained by understanding how the poles and zeros affect the frequency response magnitude.
You can also study how the poles and zeros affect the frequency response phase, but the analysis is quite a bit more complicated and consequently not as insightful.